So many people have something to say these days. Say it with a sign in your front yard, and your neighbors might get a say as well. Anti-maskers plan to gather a crowd tonight to talk about not wearing masks. Colorado's incredibly boring COVID-19 numbers are great news. Don't let the blue skies fool you. Colorado's fires continue to burn. Show you how firefighters work them from the air. And a word about the two groups desperate to fight each other in Denver Street. And the police, caught with most of the rest of us, in the middle. All that is next. Two months from Election Day, so many of the yard signs we see are not for a particular campaign. They're for causes, calling for equal justice or for peace. Yard signs also tend to gin up a special kind of outrage in some people. You had that prominent Denver realtor lose her job for stealing Black Lives Matter signs. And HOAs, they're getting swamped with calls right now. Here's our Steve Steger. You don't have to walk very far from Melissa Steele's house to find an opinion. Just circle the block and you will find everything from calls to support black lives and law enforcement to a thank you note for essential workers and a reminder not to mess with this person. Melissa puts her thoughts on one canvas in front of her door. Black lives matter. Science is real. I guess signs like this are not allowed at all. Last week, she got a letter from the Lowry Community Master Association reminding her the sign out front is in violation of the neighborhood's covenant. No signs allowed because the letter says it maintains an uncluttered visual landscape and supports and enhances this perception of a peaceful, more natural place. Under Colorado law, you have a right to post a sign tied to a political campaign on your lawn for a certain amount of time before and after an election. But state law allows community associations to make their own rules about all other signs. I've always said that it's kind of a microcosm of what's happening in the larger world. Laura Sanchez uh, is on the so board for the Community Associations Institute, a group that advises HOAs and homeowners. She says her team has gotten tons of calls about signs in the last two months. And the group's typical advice, don't be glued to your written rules. It's an opportunity to have a discussion of what is it we want our community to be like and how do we balance what's in the covenants with the times. Steele says she believes it's time for Lowry's rules to change and allow perspectives on front lawns, even the ones she might not agree with. This is a time when we can't communicate as normally as we did prior to COVID. Um, so I think this is a chance for people to express some of these things that they feel strongly about. Should give you an idea how much of a deal this is right now. The Lowry Community Association told me today they've sent about 150 of those letters in the last 90 days. They sent me a statement from their attorney. It reads in part, the Lowry Community Master Association is aware of resident concerns regarding the policy and as with all community concerns is taking them under consideration to ensure the guidelines best represent the community. Kyle. They're taking it under consideration. Uh, when my toddler asks me for something that she's never going to get, I tell her I'm taking it under consideration. Yeah, that that that's a good way to do. It. That's a good way to handle things. You know, when when you got to release a statement. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I will point out that I thought was really interesting in this conversation. You heard uh, Laura Sanchez say this was a micro that HOAs are a microcosm of what happens in the world. She says the other time she can think of it getting this political was after the election in 2000 with the hanging chads. She says that after that. HOA board elections got a whole lot more complicated. People kept challenging results when really homeowners used to not care a lot. She said that carried on for a couple of years, but it just shows, it shows you that these are really microcosms of our political world. Something tells me there's going to be a lot of contested HOA elections after the 2020 race as well. Steve, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Denver police made it clear here last night that they don't want help from armed right wing groups and they don't need that help to deal with the black bloc protesters, the anarchist type who come out to fight with police in Denver. Here's what I would say. Look at Kenosha. Look at Portland. I don't think Denver wants to go there. Uh, armed clashes in the streets between anarchists and right-wing militias with police either caught in the middle 
or just clearing out to let the two sides go at it with each other. Coloradans disagree on a whole lot of things, yet I don't think that most people want to see that in our streets. Most of the people out marching for black lives in Denver streets, they don't want to be a part of the anarchist violence and destruction after sundown. We know that because most of them go home before a small minority dressed like ninjas with helmets cause property damage and fight officers. I also don't think that most of Colorado's conservatives think that the appropriate response is to dress up like commandos and come downtown hoping for a fight that they can later call self-defense. These armed right-wing groups think that they can intimidate the anarchists out of the streets. They just throw more gasoline around for this burn-it-down crowd and plays right into the hands of the rioters. Look at Kenosha. Look at Portland. Which side won there? I just, I don't think that that's where Colorado wants to be headed. Tonight's next question comes from Rob, curious about a protest that just got started tonight at Bandemir Speedway. Rob wanted to know why Jeffco Public Health didn't just go and shut the speedway, lock the gates before they could gather a crowd tonight. Well, Rob, they didn't do that because this is America, uh, and folks do have free speech rights, both County and state public health officials stressed that today. If people want to gather to exercise their First Amendment rights to speech, they were not going to preemptively shut some event down. Now, once you get into what happens at a business that's open to the public, well, then your health regulators have a bit more control over things like crowd size. Tonight's anti-masker rally at Bandemir Speedway, which features GOP House Minority Leader Patrick Neville and right-wing activist Michelle Malkin, is supposed to be capped by public health order at no more than 175 people. Sky Nine's over top right now. Let's have a look. Uh, the event is starting right about now, uh, and it looks like, like people are spacing. That's what we like to see. People are spacing out. Is that 175 people? I don't know. I was bad at math when I was in school, and I've been out of school for a while. I'll let you decide how many people are there. Uh, one thing for sure, that's not the crowd of 7,500 that gathered on the 4th of July at Bandemir, the event that got the racetrack and its attorney slapped down by a district judge who told them that they did, in fact, have to follow public health rules. This event tonight is, is a promotion for the Speedway, which has kind of set itself up as a leading opponent of Democratic Governor Jared Polis and his public health orders, and also as a promotion slash fundraiser, perhaps, for a anti-masker lawsuit. This is the lawsuit that they filed against the governor in state Supreme Court. State Supreme Court just tossed it out, so now they're going to have to file it somewhere else. When you look at Colorado's COVID-19 numbers, one of the big questions is, is this a reflection of the mask order working, of social distancing working? You see the hospitalizations continue to plateau. 144 people currently in Colorado's hospitals with COVID-19. Our seven-day moving average to smooth out the bumps is 140 patients. It's down almost 30 patients from where it was two weeks ago. Our day-to-day -day positivity rate jumped up a bit today, more than 4% yesterday. It raises our seven-day average up a bit to 2.8%. That's still really good considering what public health officials are willing to tolerate in other places in our, our moving average is about that for the last two weeks. Time and time again here, we have revisited what could be a prime piece of real estate in the metro area that just sits sad and abandoned year after year. It's the old Kmart property at Monaco and Evans in Denver. Long story short, it seems like the property's owners think that it's worth a whole lot more than what anybody's willing to pay. So it sits and sits completely useless, like me on one of my high school sports teams until now because now they have turned it into one of those drive-up COVID-19 testing sites. It's run by Colorado COVID-19 Drive-Up. It's a testing firm that has a site in Thornton. They tell us that they have approval to use that old Kmart parking lot through the winter months should the testing demand remain strong. We love it. You know, you're right. This lot has been sitting vacant for about a decade, um, and it's such a big space in such the middle of a vibrant community, and we love the opportunity to be able to bring a vital medical service and, you know, put it in the middle of this big space that hasn't been used for a decade. The property changed hands last year. Forum Real Estate Group now owns that old Kmart lot. We reached out to them to find out if there are any future plans for development, and we did not hear back. 
pardon me, I had a malfunction there. So this new site to offer COVID-19 testing, uh, that's encouraging. Uh, but the issue becomes how quickly is the state lab and private labs able to turn those results around? What is our testing lag time? So we reached out to LabCorp. They are one of the primary providers of testing products in our state to see what their turnaround time is. We had heard some absolute horror stories on that. We're having some technical malfunctions. We're going to bring you that story after the break. All right, we turn the newscast off and back on again. I think it's working now. I want to return to this issue of Colorado's COVID-19 testing turnaround times. We told you back in July how it was taking some people anywhere from 10 days to two weeks to get their test results back after they got one of those brain tickler uh, nasal swabs. Uh, the problem apparently was with LabCorp, which was analyzing all the tests given at the state's largest free testing site. It was getting bogged down because there was so much demand around the country. We asked LabCorp, what we thought was a pretty simple question, what's your testing turnaround time now in Colorado? And we got a classic PR response. Can we get our press release reading music, please? LabCorp has surpassed 12 million molecular tests performed since first making our COVID-19 test available in March. With a continued focus on expanding capacity and reducing the time to deliver results, we are updating our current average results delivery time to 24 to 48 hours from specimen pick from specimen pickup. They still actually don't answer the question. It's it's one to two days after they pick up your specimen. When do they pick up your specimen? I don't know. I read through the entire statement. It never says there. Curious, though, about your testing experience, especially if you've been through it more than once. You have a point of comparison. Email us next at 9news.com or get our attention on Twitter with the hashtag HeyNext. So we're pretty fortunate to have clear skies over Denver right now because our state's four large wildfires continue to burn. And there were meteorologists worried that we could get socked in with smoke through most of September on the front range. Back to the air, though, and how firefighters are operating from above. Our Mark Salinger shows us how they do it. The destination is usually somewhere between a wall of smoke and a spreading fire line. We don't put the fire out, we just slow it down. Armed with up to 3,000 gallons of fire retardant at a time. They're fast. The army of planes and helicopters based in Broomfield have already gone to battle with 45 fires this season, from Colorado to Wyoming to South Dakota to New Mexico. It's been 205 missions we have come out of this base for 572,000 gallons of retardant. It's been a busy couple of months for Scott Hedrick and the rest of the U.S. Forest Service team at the Air Tanker Base at the Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport in Jefferson County. We had up to six large air tankers working out of here. That's six tankers on one day. A carefully choreographed all-out aerial attack on fires from Grand Junction to Grand County. 15 minutes is how long it takes us to, to load them, fuel them, and send them off to the fire. This year has been particularly busy with uh, aerial firefighting. Airports like Rocky Mountain Metropolitan play a vital role in providing bases where the planes can launch from as soon as a new fire sparks. It seems like starting at about noon uh, and almost going till dusk, it seems like they're, they're doing turns very quickly. The planes are strategically positioned at four airports across the state that have runways long enough and strong enough. So when the large air tankers take off out of here, they use most of the runway. A daring plunge out of the sky and into the smoke that could save lives and homes. All air tankers that we use um, are a vital tool in fighting wildland fires. And this base can be fully operational within just a couple of hours if a fire starts at any point in the year. Now, however, it is fully staffed from April through the beginning of October. We'll have to see how the fires go over the next month to see how operational it is this year. Kyle. All right. Mark Salinger reporting while ensconced in the shrubbery of the palatial Salinger estate. Thank you, Mark. They were doing their part to increase diversity in the art community, and then the pandemic happened. If there ever were a time, you know, when people really needed um, that creativity to keep going in their lives, like, it, it's now. So they had to get creative. It's a good thing that's their specialty. There are businesses and organizations that are just kind of getting around to understanding that inclusive, inclusivity matters. 
The Art Students League of Denver has long tried to get a diversity of voices into our art community. The challenge now is doing that outreach safely during a pandemic. So we're standing outside the Art Students League of Denver, which is in the former Sherman School at 200 Grant Street in Denver. And today is significant because it's the first day that we are reopening for in-person courses. To welcome back our people, we have two very exciting outdoor art exhibits. This exhibit was myself and Susie Q. Smith, who is a spoken word artist. I'm a visual artist. This one is definitely more personal, I think just because of the story that is being told. You're trying to make sure that you're honoring the voices, you know what I mean, that um, all kind of have played a part in this story. And this is a, a long, story. And we really want to make sure that every person in our community feels comfortable coming into our space and feels welcome and sees themselves reflected. And so we've been having a lot of conversations about how we can do that, how we need to change, how we need to grow. Um, and as a result, we're doing a lot of, of new and different programming. We have a very active art in prison program working with um, the Denver Women's Correctional Facility. We are doing a lot of community programming through libraries and after school programs. And I think that these programs are important because they really do help people also really tap into like what they already have. On March 16th, we had to close down the Art Students League for all of the programming that we were offering here. And that same week, the after school programs were stopped. The libraries all closed. Um, the Denver Women's Correctional Facility stopped all of their programming. In the meantime, over these last few months, we have been doing a lot of programming virtually. We're hopeful that perhaps some of those people who we might have previously interacted with in their community locations, we can get the word out that they can come here. If there ever were a time, you know, when people really needed that creativity to keep going in their lives, like, it, it's now. The most Colorado thing we saw today are some very, very slow hikers. Add your feedback next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a hiking buddy who will help carry your extra gear without complaint. Problem is, he's a total jackass, but you have to put up with it because he's so helpful. Every one of those burrows for that hike in Park County over the weekend was tremendously helpful. This is a group working to rehabilitate the North London Mill site near Alma. They put together a hike near Mosquito Pass. The organizers tell us that the donkeys are a joy to hike with, except for when they're not. Your feedback this evening, Angel says no more coverage on Bandamere. It's what they really want. I understand that perspective, Angel, but the folks there at Bandamere do represent the counter viewpoint to the governor. Uh, they may be a minority, but I think we should still represent their viewpoint. See you next time.